Hi, and welcome to our third episode of Masters of Growth, the podcast show for actionable advice for optimizers out there, powered by Iridion. Uh, today, I have, of course, the pleasure to have my co-host, Andre, with me as well. Hi, Andre. Hi. And <laughs> Hello. We the, uh, already being in our second real episode, we already have our first guest on the show, which is Michael Agard. Hi, Michael. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to have you on the show. Um, okay. So before we jump in our usual Q&A format, like answering questions from the, from the yeah. audience, um, Michael, for the very few listeners out there who listen to this show but are not aware who you are, uh, could you might introduce yourself very briefly? Yeah, so I've been, uh, I've been doing zero full-time for 10 years now. It's wow. uh, 2018, so that marks the 10th year, which is nice. pretty cool. And um, I've worked for agencies in, uh, in my career, and I've uh, had in-house positions too. And uh, I've spent a lot of time as a solo uh, consultant. And I'm, I'm back to doing my own thing now. But that means that I, uh, I, I've, I've been in many different uh, situations, and I've kind of seen the zero game, both from the, you know, the agency side, the solo consultant side, and the, the in-house automizer side. And um, in my career, I've, I've worked for companies all over the world. Um, the, the company I just worked for was Unbounce, and uh, cool. that brought me here to British Columbia. And uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm, I'm here for life. You're back in the independent game. Yes. <laughs> nice, very cool. Pleasure to have you here. Thank um, you. So I think let's, we got quite an amount of questions for, uh, for today, so let's uh, jump right into them. Um, the mm -hmm. first question um, we got was that, um, someone wants to know what are the typical pitfalls that most optimizers have to overcome when implementing an optimization process, right? So not only doing like very single A-B tests, but really having a full process up and running in companies. Well, I, I think the main thing is that very few people have a process <laughs> to implement. <laughs> so that makes it really difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think the whole CRO thing, I think one of the things that's, People talk about what's wrong in the industry or something like that. I think one of the things is that a lot of this blame or whatever, one of the things that makes CRO really difficult is that there is honestly a lot of incompetence in the okay. industry, a lot of bullshitters. Um, a lot of them aren't really bullshitters. They're, they're, a lot of them don't know that they're incompetent. I, and I'm not trying to sound arrogant. This is just me speaking from experience. I used to be one of them. I've learned the hard way by making a lot of mistakes. But I think we, we make it harder for ourselves in the industry because there's a lot of people who uh, get carried away and, and don't really understand what conversion rate optimization is. Um, they get very focused on uh, running as many random A-B tests as possible you know, without really understanding the stats behind it and so on. And it, it quickly becomes kind of this magic uh, formula where you, you, know, you, you get this great idea and you test it and then everything gets better, 600% increase. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so obviously that's not really the truth. Um, and most of us find out that it takes a while if you don't have a science mm. uh, background. And so I think that just kind of spreads because then a lot of companies have an experience where they have these consultants, <laughs> cowboy consultants yeah. running yeah. all these tests and stuff. And they, and they're like, I'm paying all this money. You're claiming on these incredible lifts and stuff, but I'm not making more money. And that just spreads a kind of general uh, distrust. One of the things I, I do when I speak to new clients is I have to explain kind of where I'm coming from because they're suspicious and they should be. And one of the things I tell them is I, I, I don't claim to be able to tell the future. I'm mm. not Don Draper. I don't belong to that <laughs> school of thought. I believe that we have to use a lot of research and a, a scientific, some, somewhat scientific approach, you know, to understand this stuff. And it's really about, I think the, I don't, I wouldn't say the customer is all right, always right, but the, we have to try to sell the way, I mean, our customers want to buy. And a lot of this is, you know, it's not about forcing them to do what we want them to do, but understanding kind of mm. like the right context and how do we actually facilitate this, you know, and also what is, uh, what is motivation, what is psychological barriers and what are, you know, physical UX barriers and all this stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I say those, uh, those kind of combine to make a big pitfall. Yeah. So, what uh, do you have any, any? What's your pro tip? I mean, you have been on the in-house side. So, how do you um, see? Maybe you you have one, two, three questions you ask. Maybe only one <laughs> to, to see. Or what do the usual suspects say? So, how do you um, um, see if, if an optimizer is one one of these Don Draper guys or uh, Dan Draper guys, or or if he's a serious optimizer? How, how well, do you make the difference? Well, I think if you have a process is one of the really good uh, tell, uh, tell, uh, tell signs. If, if, 
you're interviewing someone, you go, so what's your process? Uh, and then maybe they go, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, okay. Just, just, bye That's bye. what Pep yeah. says. Pep says, uh, <laughs> he, he always asks people first, and, and that's a very good question. What's your process? So there you can split between the beginners and the ones who realized it's a, it's a process. But process sounds boring, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, I know. But, process. But, yeah, what it's, uplifts? You should call it program. Yeah, program. but yeah. but I think having a process, actually knowing how to get from from A to B to C and so on, is is super important. Very few people have that, and a lot of it just becomes like very very tactical, tactical stuff. Um, so yeah, if you, if you're interviewing someone, I'd say what's your process? I would, for example, ask them about you know A B testing, for example. I say so. How would you go about you know maybe give them some numbers or show them a report in Google Analytics and numbers and say so. For example, just judging by this page here, the, the traffic, you can see the current conversion rate and so on. What would you, uh, how would you go about testing this page? And I would maybe be sneaky and use it as a trick question, uh, like a page that clearly does not have enough traffic to be able to run tests on. Yeah. And, and if the person goes, oh, well, first I would, uh, uh, I would, uh, you know, use this, the, the, the six best practices from this <laughs> and that, and then I'd test one of them until it, it said 95%, uh, da, 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 and then I'd, I'd test the next thing. Then that shows to me um, a lack of confidence because the person, the first thing they should say is, "Well, I'm not going to test anything because it's just not enough traffic for it to make sense in this page." Yeah. If they said that, I'd be like, "Ooh, yeah," you know. So stuff like that, um, because I think one of the typical things is that people who are not really into zero or haven't spent a long time, a long enough time to, to actually get it, <laughs> yeah. is uh, they'll quickly get into the whole A/B testing uh, spiel. Yeah. without really having a clear idea of why. And one thing I say often is it's a hypothesis. It's an assumption. You think you can run a test, but you have to make sure. Uh, and then another thing is I would um, <clears throat> maybe ask them a question around research or, again, an open question and see if they then would approach this uh, situation uh, with, with, with a process that relies on, on research. So, for example, you could say something like a, a fictitious situation. Uh, the current landing page isn't uh, uh, performing. We um, have a suspicion that it's the uh, whatever the offer, the value that is not connecting with the audience. What would you do? Yeah. And again, if the person says, "Well, I would sit down in a room with a lot of other marketers and I discuss it for a while and I come up mm. with ten different ideas and I test them all and I'd say, yeah, I think the interview is over." If they went into uh, <laughs> if they described the process where they said, "Well," I, I don't know for sure, and you know you could start testing, but it's probably not a good idea. You need to have an, you know you need to have a hypothesis first. You need to have kind of like an idea of, of where you're going here. So I would start by reaching out, seeing if I could interview some customers, get a bit of understanding of their yeah. motivation, or you say like I've started running feedback polls on the landing page to have a better understanding of this, something like that. Or maybe they say I contact the salespeople, uh, customer success, and talk to them and see yeah. if they have something to contribute with. They often do, you know. Again, like just going deeper. And, and explaining that you have an actual process uh, for figuring this stuff out rather than just the old. So, I, I, yeah, I think a lot of it goes back to still having this, uh, a lot of marketers have this, uh, and I think it's a mix between is ego, a little bit of arrogance, and also just kind of like just um, marketing classically being this kind of voodoo thing where you have to be able to like figure out what people want without before they know it and stuff. And I, I, I don't think that's a very constructive mm -hmm. way to think of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, one thing I wanted to pick up on was like, you just mentioned that um, you learn from mistakes during your career as well. Like what, what works, what, what's a good process, how to approach stuff. Are there like, could you name some exa specific examples of mistakes you made, which were, were like light bulb moments for you? Like where you really like, wow, oh, wow. Yeah. That's a revelation. Yeah, so I, I think one of the big problems, same thing for me, is that we have like, we have a lot of marketers uh, trying to be scientific without knowing what that means. And I don't claim to be a professor or anything, but I've spent a while now trying to trying to learn this stuff, and I think that's a big problem. Um, I work with several scientists now, uh, PhDs, and I'm very grateful for that because I've learned a lot and I've become a lot better by understanding, you know, their methodology around this stuff. So I think that's a problem for a lot of us. And uh, so one of, some of the big aha moments, for example, for me was just coming to that realization. And, you know, I had a lot of humbling, almost humiliating experiences, mm. you know, where you uh, have to go back to the drawing board and go, yeah, wow, I really, I really did not understand this. So I've had, a, a, you know, 
quite a few of those. And then at, at some point, I just got to the realization saying, I'm going to be a student forever with this, you know, and yeah. that is, again, I'm not claiming to be a true scientist, but that is, as far as I can understand, you know, what real science is, is about never thinking, never having Never done. Yeah, I think I think that that's one of the values that every optimizer should have. Al always be humble. And when when you said how how to separate the good from a bad optimizer, you, you said as as a good optimizer, when you can't answer two questions, you say maybe I don't know. And I see a lot of times in in corporations, uh, people are not courage enough to say you know I don't know, but I can find out. You know, we can make oh, sure. experiments. So. Be, being able to say, I don't know, but I will find out. That's maybe one of the things that are important, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And that, but that also, that takes confidence and, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you have to be confident uh, in your own skills uh, and it takes some maturity also to say, I don't know. Yeah, no, but I, I definitely say that honesty is, is way better than, than bullshitting your way out of, you know, a tough situation. So that, that was one of the big uh, aha moments for me. And then another one, two other aha moments were when I, and like figure out that you know that split testing wasn't this magical thing. I think a lot of people are getting to that uh, conclusion. And then also just learning, like going back to the statistics, uh, you know, going back and actually understanding statistics properly and you know research. Research was another big thing for me. And um, you know, some years back, I, I just decided that I would never ever ever again run a split test to do any form of optimization project without you know a lot of research because. To me, it doesn't make sense to do it without. Just to be clear, like research for you does mean like gathering also qualitative data next to the oh, qualitative? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, qualitative is extremely important. It's, uh, it's quantitative and qualitative. Uh, so in my process, typically what I do is I, I try to do, I try to get a feeling for whatever it is, whether it's a whole website or a landing page, whatever it is. Like, for example, landing page, I'll say, just give me the ad, give me the landing page, and let me go through the whole conversion experience. And I try not to be a marketer, and I just try to, you know, through an, an empathic work through, just try to understand where I get confused, where are things going wrong for me. And that gives me an idea of, you know, some of the things that could be wrong. Maybe there's just some regular, some normal best practice stuff you can use there to make it a little bit better. Like I can't see the button, I can't, there's some headlines, stuff like that. The form is all weird. I write all that down. The next step then is going into analytics then and I'm trying to get, you know, some quantitative insight on whether what I'm observing uh, might be reflected in, in user behavior, you know, so step drop analysis and stuff like this, figure out, you know, kind of what, what devices are relevant here and so on. So, you, you know, you, you start with this picture where you have a few pieces and you keep filling them in, you know, and so the way I think about it is, you know, uh, quantitative is, is answering stuff like, uh, um, what and where and then when you get to why stuff that's when you go to yeah. uh, quality of research and the qualitative is, is amazing and i think you know, in on, online stuff it, it often gets uh, uh, undervalued because like oh big data you know yeah, totally um so and yeah so so i love that and i and i think that's part of the the cool thing about uh, this process is this curiosity becoming a detective i love that getting lost in research or whatever it sounds really boring but i yeah, I think that's one of the most important things. Yeah, what, also, what, what I think uh, is also especially to, to highlight, especially from my perspective, is that uh, the biggest thing I warn people about when doing an optimization or product development process is confirmation bias, right? Like bias. And I mean, you can, you can have a bias when you, do, when you look at the quantitative data, right? You can always interpret it, the data like the way you want it to, but you can always like have your bias come in when you do qualitative surveys. Like you can always ask the person the way, the right way so that your answer wins. Oh, right? yeah. Right. Which, don't, don't you think this is a great product? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, but it, it's interesting you say confirmation bias because that's one of my favorite topics. Yeah, I, I have totally. a whole talk I've been on the road with. Oh, nice. Bias. I, I love it. It's one of the most fascinating things in, in psychology to me. Yeah. And it is very, very detrimental. I would argue that the, the scientific process is, is there for the sole purpose of countering the detrimental effects of uh, confirmation bias. And yeah. it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Thing. We, we have a blog post out saying 90% of AB test results are a lie. And we say because of confirmation bias, most optimizers say, oh, it's, it's actually significant. I stopped the test now uh, because they just want to hear it. And the second best answer is if the test has no significant result, uh, they say, oh, there must be something wrong with the tracking, I'm sure. <laughs> of course. Of course.
There's, yeah. there's a fine line between being like skeptical and questioning data, like, <laughs> like not believing all the data and like having confirmation bias. It's, it's mm. Well, I think the big, the, big, the big difference is being skeptical only when it's not showing you what you want to see. And being <laughs> exactly. Not, that's even better. <laughs> yeah. So totally. what, you want to see. <laughs> what, what I found interesting is what um, a couple of minutes ago we discussed the thing of like, it takes courage to say like, hey, I'm wrong. I don't know stuff, right? I mean, this also leads to a, to a cultural question, right? I mean, like, do you actually have, do you encourage a culture at your company which encourages people to say, I don't know, uh, and always like have this continuous curiosity uh, actually encouraged instead of uh, everybody needs to know everything. So for me, it's kind of a good segue into the next, next question is like, do you think that optimization needs a special cultural set at companies? Like is maybe even culture the, the biggest conversion killer out there despite like putting stuff below the fold and having wrong button colors? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a massive one, but it's it's, it's also a difficult, difficult uh, uh, one, you know, one to answer. What is optimization culture? But I think one of the things is you have to have a culture where it's okay to uh, fail. I'm not saying you're encouraging people to fail, but it, you have to have a setup that allows you, to, you know, like the cliche, fail quickly. But I yeah. think that's very true. You know, because if people are super paranoid about experimenting, then they're just going to keep doing exactly the same thing they've always done. You know, and and I think. <laughs> You know, you, sometimes you, there's like that expression, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. But in marketing, I'd say insanity is, is doing the same thing and expecting, <laughs> you know, the same outcome. Because people do that. They figure out best practice and they do that for everything. That's, yeah. that's kind of crazy. But anyways, uh, so in optimization culture, you have to be able to experiment, right? And then also, you have to have a culture, a diverse culture. By that, I mean... You can't just have freaking marketers, 60 marketers doing this. Like it's, it drives me nuts. Morgan Brown, I saw him do a talk, it was really cool. He was talking about you know, the same thing and he was saying, for God's sake, don't hire any more marketers. Get someone who can write code, someone who knows data. And I, I love that. I think it's such a good point because uh, we don't need more marketers doing this, right? You need, for the right culture, it has to be diverse enough that you have, you know, you have a data scientist, you, you freaking need that. You need someone who's really good at research, you know? Hmm. You obviously need, someone who knows something about marketing right like a cross-functional team basically and then you need the and again it sounds like a cliche but silos are a massive killer it's, 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 it's a massive, again <laughs> sorry it's a massive killer it's my phone it's hooked up to the computer so it, it whenever someone calls it, it goes straight through sorry um um Shit. Silos it. are a massive killer. Si silos. Si yeah, silos. It sounds like a cliche, but silos are there and they're there all the time. And even all these companies who think they don't have silos, they have silos. Yeah, yeah. It's a massive problem. And in, in, in my roles, I've always, and I don't know where this comes from, but I guess it's because either I'm, I'm arrogant or fearless enough that I don't care, but I, I'm going to go talk to the people in sales if they can give me the best answers. I'm going to go talk to the developers if, I, if they can help me. I'm going to go straight to you know, customer, customer success is there. That's where I get my answers. So the thing is, it's, you know, it's almost like people sometimes think they're not allowed to talk to their colleagues or something like this. But you need, you know, collaboration across teams. And then, obviously, you need buy-in from leadership, which is another big thing. But that goes back to the competence thing. Because why should leadership, you know, facilitate this culture if they don't have competent people doing it? And that's another problem because a lot of companies and agencies underestimate this and they go like you over there in the corner what's your name <laughs> yeah john you you know analytics right cool you're a new zero champion or something like that and that's a bit exaggerated but some, sometimes that happens or at an agency you have uh, this person who's like senior conversion optimizer or whatever they've been doing for six months you know so that's not probably not going to be the best way to start such a culture. But isn't it also a problem? I mean, we talked about marketing people not qualified enough to do that job. Uh, optimizers call uh, the, the C-suite hippos. Uh, I mean, isn't that also a little bit of an arrogance? And wh why should we expect C-suite giving us a couple of hundred thousand bucks to optimize if we call them hippos? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you have, obviously, they're, they're the protected of their companies, of course. So you have to prove to them that's your job. You have to come to that you can do that. Yeah. And don't call them hippos. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, exactly. not, not publicly. <laughs> no. That's also. It's, it's, yeah, I think that's. It, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm a little bit fascinated actually that that, that word gets thrown around so much still. It was quite.
quite fun 10 years ago, but it's, 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 it's kind of, yeah, I think like you're saying, people need to let that go mm. because it's, it's, it is super derogative and you call someone that, why should they listen to it? Because then you've already, you know, put them in, in the corner or whatever. But obviously, I mean, you know, C-suite people are people like everybody else. There's a lot of bias and ego and stuff. That's true. But, um, but also they, they, they have a lot of skin in the game. They, you know, you need to be able to convince them that you can do this, um, you know, and then you have to be able to pull through afterwards and not, you know, and if, if they, they've probably all already been through a couple of consultants who couldn't do this, you know. But then another thing I think is, is, the, whole, is the whole kind of uh, cortisol, you know, knee-jerk reaction, you know, <laughs> uh, that, you know, when you panic, if things are not going the way you want them to go, and then you have to do something. That's what cortisol is. It's like uh, the do-something hormone, right? And I think that happens a lot. So you, you inject some money here, you're doing it for a little bit, and they're like, ah, it's not going the way I want to. Okay, let's hire another consultant. <laughs> I've, I've seen that happen quite a lot, where it's almost like sometimes companies see a higher value in, in change, any change, than you know, actually sticking to, to a program. So that I think that's another thing, is you then have to invest in it, and you have to try to build it up and, and have the confidence you know, to do this. Actually, I was talking to... Uh, a person from Airbnb the other day, and they have, they have a data university that employees go through before they start working with this stuff. That's wow! All that is beautiful. It's incredible because that's, I think that that's one of the, the best ways to actually get a real uh, you know experimentation optimization culture. Then that might seem expensive. You're investing in that, but. It's way better than you know, you know all the horror, <laughs> you know all the horrible stuff that will happen down the road. Because you're educating people up front, that means everybody's on the same page. That's another thing I've experienced at company is, you know, especially if you have a large intake of new employees, you're constantly trying to like, oh, you know, then you have to bring them up to speed, and they don't, you know, they probably don't have a background in statistics or something like that, and then you have to you know, start over every single time. So I, I thought that was amazing when I heard that from, from Airbnb. Yeah, so I, um, let me jump in with one, one, another question that um, I think it's very important because I see a lot of optimizers doing their, their work somewhere and not having a lot of um, a management attention. So would you have any advice to an optimizer um, that does an important job, but you know, management is not very A-B testing knowledge. So what, what should I do if I'm an in-house optimizer and want more management attention? What, what's your... Speak up. <laughs> with what? No, that's, that's the yeah, just talk to them. Because that's another thing, like, you know, like I was saying with the silos stuff before, it's like people are, are like, you know, it's, they have a lot of uh, inhibitions or whatever. That they're, they're, it's, it's like, oh, people are scared of getting out of the comfort zone or whatever. And you're like, ah, oh, I better just sit by my desk. So you have to have, uh, you, I, you know, you have to have an, be, be bold enough or whatever. Or you have to be enthusiastic, passionate. That's probably it. Be passionate enough that you can't help but keep up. You're like, this is I'm, I'm bold. Yeah. Wow. Empathy for passion. You, yeah, well, what I'm seeing here is not good enough. I have to make someone aware of this, right? And I think that's the thing. So you have to do political work, right? If you have the competencies, you know, you can do this right and you can prove what you're doing, you can prove the results, you have a process, well, then, you know, it's, it's a question of being, you know, a good in-house consultant, you can always say, and a good in-house consultant, it's his or her job to find this stuff, present it to management, and, and sometimes you have to fight, and sometimes you don't win that fight, but if you don't, if you don't even try, you know, nothing's going to happen, right? So you can't just sit there and expect them to discover you. That's not the way it works. So, yeah, I think that's the number one thing is actually getting a hold of them, establishing contacts with them. You know, you could, you could say, hey, can we go out for lunch next week because there's something I'd love to show you or call a meeting with them. You know, there's a lot of ways of doing this. Start sending emails to the whole company and saying, this is the research I discovered. You've got to do political work, and that is across the yeah. whole company. I think that's, something, that's something most people probably are not aware of like okay i can i focus on my craft i will produce great results and then successful follow and that's actually not true because like you also have to like add this political this outgoing you to the mix i okay. i think most optimizers are not able to sell the the implication of their job to the strategic level um, yeah. and, and that's a big problem because from a strategic level there's one heuristic says if i want to change much i have to to do big projects so um, and, and optimization is a lot about incremental change and um, they have to learn that a lot of incremental change sums up to a real big thing 
And, and that's where I say that optimizers fail to sell um, their strategic impact of their work. So, so yeah. if, if yeah, they, but, like, but, but that again goes, I think goes back to having a process or not. And if you don't have that, then you're stuck in tactics and then there is no strategy to sell. And you know, a good manager or a good leader would pick up on that and go, I'm not getting a sense that you have a long-term vision for this. I'm getting the sense that you're very tactical and that I can throw one problem at you and maybe you can solve that, but I'm not seeing you, you know, uh, it illustrates to me that you're in this for the long run, right? Yeah. So that's part of it, you know? So for example, if you get an in-house role, what I recommend, you need to, the chops to do it. We're not going to get into that now, but for example, you know, going, doing a full review of, if it's an e-commerce website, you got to do a full review. You get a, you know, full idea of the whole thing. Then you can present that. And you can, so the weakest point could, for example, be uh, the checkout funnel, which it often is. You know, you ident identify that. You identify how much money you're using there, how much you could actually gain by fixing it, how to fix it, you scope the project, and then you pitch it. And then at the same time, you say, this is the one most important thing we can do. It's going to take a long time. We need buy-in from this. You talk to the product people or whatever. And then you can launch that. And then you can say, so while we're waiting for that, we're going to start chopping away at these uh, six landing pages that bring us X amount of our revenue every month. We can start doing that now. And at the same time, I'm going to start you know, doing recordings here and here. And I'm going to interview these customers. I'm going to talk to sales. I'm going to do this. Yeah. You know, then you've got like all this laid out and then you say, and then you can start actually showing them that you're, you're capable of strategic and critical thinking. Yeah. And I love, I love that. I yeah. love that. Like, of like, when you come into a new role, like do the full review, like make it go out there, like uh, claim your credit for that. And then like, know your stakeholders. Yeah. Impress yeah. your stakeholders. Yeah. Exactly. Don't hide in the basement. No, yeah. <laughs> go upstairs. Be visible. Go know the stakeholders. Well, uh, hey, another thing is uh, talk to the different uh, stakeholders. Yeah, figure out who they are and then talk to them and say, hey, what's a great scenario? Well, you know, what would, what, how can I help you? What do you think the problems are? What would help you in your situation? What are you, what are the questions you have that you can't figure out or something? How can I help you with my research or something like that? Again, your status is, is, is also about people trusting you and understanding that you're, you know, you can actually do this, which is another thing that I find weird sometimes is consultants often think that they can just go through, the, they get offended if people don't just trust them. We're like, wow, you have to earn that. You know, that's part of the role. You can't just get angry, you know. Your ego may be hurt for a second, but, you know, just understand the background. Yeah, really interesting. Cool. Um, Michael, maybe a little plug towards the end of our conversation. So you're also coming to Germany and in, uh, in September for speaking at the Growth Summit in Frankfurt. Yes. Uh, what can people expect from your talk? In 60 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Do, the <pitch. laughs> well, Do the elevator pitch. Why should I come to hear well, your talk? Well, the title is uh, You're Making My Brain Hurt, The Psychology Behind Terrible Conversion Experiences. So, <laughs> That, that says a lot already there. It's, it's a very practical uh, psychology session, but I'll be digging into just um, some pretty uh, well-established but common uh, psychological principles. Uh, and then I'm going to be showing a lot of practical examples of how this kind of works uh, in real life and how you can use it uh, for uh, conversion optimization. And it's not going to be one of those things where I'm just, you know, bullshitting my way through a bunch of uh, regurgitated uh, things from other books. I've, I've done original research for this. I've reconstructed other, you know, psych well established psychologist um, tests, and I've, I've done them for myself and so on. And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good stories and examples in this. So it's uh, it's one of my more entertaining uh, nice. <laughs> talks. I'm looking forward to doing it. And uh, also, I'd say I. I actually love what's growth summit now, but conversion summit as it was before. I've been there several times and I, I've always had an amazing time. I think it's fantastic. Really? Conference, one of the best time ever. Cool. Nice. Thank so, you, Michael. We're, we're forward. really looking forward to see you. Definitely. There. If yeah. you, dear listener, if you want to find out more about uh, the Growth Marketing Summit, go to growthmarketingsummit.com to check out the agenda, learn more about Michael's talk, uh, and of course, secure your spot. Great. Cool. Michael, Really cool to have you on. Really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Uh, where can people go to find out more uh, about what you do, what you write, how to follow you? You go to uh, michaelagar.com. And uh, yeah, I'm still everything uh, at the website, so there's not a ton of on there. But uh, otherwise, go to my LinkedIn, uh, check that out. Cool. We will link both in the, in the show notes, of course. 
Uh, great. So this would it be for our, uh, today's episode. So if you, dear listener, or viewer, have any questions you want us to answer in the future, make sure to hit us your should, uh, send us your questions using the hashtag MOG Masters of Growth on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Havik T. Andre is at Morris on Twitter. We're looking forward to your questions and uh, your next episode. And of course, if you enjoy the show as much as we do, leave us a review on iTunes, an honest one, of course. And uh, we'll talk to you in the next episode. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.